Welcome to the Viewless Wings Poetry Podcast, where we celebrate the craft of poetry. Each week, we feature interviews with incredible poets and artists, including Olivia Gatwood and A.E. Stallings, and original poetry read by the authors. I'm your host, James Moorhead, poet laureate of Dublin, California, and author of Canvas and Portraits of Red and Gray. Stelios Bomoris is a resident of Boston and Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts, and formerly lived in Paris most of his life, working as an executive in the beauty industry. Stelios is currently Chief Executive Officer of Scent Beauty Incorporated. He studied architecture at Princeton University, where he received his BA, and received his MBA from INSEAD in Fontainebleau, France. He has held positions on the boards of the French Cultural Center of Boston, ACT UP, Historic New England, and the Fragrance Foundation. Stelios is also a contemporary artist specializing in abstract oil painting. His interests range from rugby to sailing to gardening, while continuing his passion for reading and writing poetry. The Oculus is his debut collection of poetry. Stelios, welcome to the Viewless Wings Poetry Podcast. Thank you so much, James. It's uh, great to be here. I'm, uh, as you know, I'm at the Reform Club in London in a drawing room somewhere, and uh, this is a place I think is well known for being the uh, on-site location for Downtown Abbey, among other things, which I guess is its own form of poetry. But I'm, you know, very happy to be here. It's now uh, around uh, probably 7 p.m. here, and pouring rain outside, of course. And uh, I made it here to join your podcast. So very happy to be here. Yes, you have a wonderful location and backdrop. And for those, since this is a podcast and it's audio, you have to imagine an appropriately Downton Abbey library setting. It's very, very <laughs> appropriate, appropriate for a, a literature podcast. So for, before talking about the Oculus, when did you first discover poetry and what do you love about the art form? So I actually first discovered poetry when I was a teenager and my mother Margarita Zittis, it was her maiden name. She left on my bed, I think when I was 13 years old, Khalil Gibran's The Prophet. And she just left it on my bed, presumably for me to read. And then I read it on my own. And then, you know, days later, she asked me what I thought of it. And it was interesting, but it was sort of my first, um, I think, introduction to literature. It was a very deep message. This is the time, by the way, of all the 1960s social turbulence, uh, civil rights movement, Vietnam War. And uh, I think she was just trying to teach me that, you know, not only read what I'm given in school, but to go out on my own and start reading. So that was, I'd say, my first inspiration, if you will, to read. And then afterwards, I started discovering, you know, poets in the local library, you know, famous poets like Robert Frost and, you know, William Butler Yeats and like learning the classics. And I was, I think, always fascinated by the beauty of the English language mm -hmm. and how much it could evoke um, or wake the imagination and, and just the clever ways in which, you know, language has a kind of heightened, elevated sense. Mm -hmm in the form of poetry. Absolutely. Um, that's a beautiful way to be introduced to uh, poetry as an art form. So how do you shape an idea into a poem? Uh, how do your poems tend to start? And what feedback do you rely on during the revision and editing process? Perhaps to ground this in something specific, uh, use your poem, The Trolley, as an example to draw from for going through this, uh, this process from idea to a, a poem that you feel is publishing worthy. Sure. Sometimes the, the beginning part of the question I can answer, um, it's very um, mysterious, actually, how a poem comes to fruition. Sometimes it's from a line of poetry that somehow enters my mind and is like a musical form that I expound on. Sometimes I plan a poem around a concept, around an idea, and then force myself to write about it even if, if it feels unnatural. And sometimes a, a poem is just simply, uh, in my case, I'd say elicited by a memory of being somewhere or something or some person. In the case of the trolley, um, this is a poem 
written about someone in San Francisco, uh, actually in a place I know well, which is the top of Knob Hill. If anyone is from San Francisco out there, the poem starts out of this person, the speaker per se, um, at the corner of California and Powell, which is at the top of Knob Hill, and just waiting for a trolley. And, you know, I, I in my life stayed at the hotels, uh, the Mark Hopkins and and uh, the Fairmont, and these are very beautiful hotels in San Francisco, a place where my parents lived in the 50s before I was born. And um, the poem sort of took off on its own. So it started out as this speaker, presumably young man. I wouldn't say it's autobiographical. It, very often it's interesting that as a poet, when you speak to readers, they automatically assume what you're writing about is about you. But in this case, it's about a speaker who's waiting for a trolley. And the poem is simply a very simple moment that intensifies as you get into the mind of the person waiting for a trolley and his sense of anticipation of what the trolley will do and where the trolley can take him. And what's interesting about visually about San Francisco and this particular vantage point on the top of a hill that are so steep in San Francisco, you can't see what's coming. You could hear what's coming. You can't see. And what I love about this poem, and I'm glad you raised that, James, that poem as an illustration because it's a pretty accessible poem, is the speaker is describing the sensation of the trolley approaching by sound and by the feeling of the tracks he's standing on. And all these emotions come forth and you realize the speaker at the end of the poem is lost and is wanting a place to find belonging. And that is basically how the poem came about. No, I think that's a wonderful breakdown of um, that where poetry is such an interesting art form because you don't need to have you know, a massive plot or a huge chunk of context, the, 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 the sound of the cables running in the trench. And I've, you know, ridden the cable cars many, many times that, yeah, you hear that before you always hear it, this, the, the cable rattling through the trench and then the sounds change as the cable car approaches. That's a wonderful right. starting point. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Right. So that was a, Fun poem, I would say. It was a hard poem to write. I, I will reveal one of the struggles of a poet. So I'm always worried as a writer uh, just writing prose that's broken up in terms of visual form into a poem. And um, if that's a strategy, then that can work as poetry. But in this case, I was writing about a very simple theme of this speaker waiting for a trolley, describing the trolley arriving, and then and the kind of visual context of San Francisco. So it was a hard poem to densify and, and jam words and language. So there was a lot of tension and it was very packed with images. So in the end, it didn't really read like prose. It read like poetry and kind of brought you to its conclusion when the trolley arrives after all. And then the speaker reveals that he needs some sense of belonging and is just looking for a place to go. Cool. Well, uh, building on that, several of the poems in this collection have visceral elements. And I'll give a couple of examples, a couple of excerpts. In Death of an Argument, you write, You could not rise airward, only disintegrate inside the shoals smashing waves, whipped up figurines of silver froth breaking and repeating in the broken link of the archipelago, like our unfinished remarks. And in the temper, you write, Meanwhile, your blade would rotate in the dark I kept you in, the steel light intensifying on the turn, then flattening to glare, lingering long after it vanished. What draws you to these powerful images, which, I, which, which are, are definitely a, a, an element of throughout the book? And what is your approach to capturing them so effectively in poetry? I think in those two cases... I enjoy the art of metaphor. So somehow I push my imagination and linguistic construction to visualize something and then ask myself, what does the visualization really mean? So in the case of death of an, of the, of an argument, the, the description of these sort of waves hitting these rocks and dissolving and breaking is a metaphor 
for an argument between two people who are intimate with each other and how in the crashing of the waves and um, the dissolution of the foam and this sort of the broken link of the archipelago and um, all this sort of destruction and renewal, I liken to an endless argument, an endless argument. Um, and actually, it's ironic, I think, now that I'm speaking about it, that I call the poem Death of an Argument, because in fact, I think the death never happened. I think the argument's eternal. I should have retitled it Eternal Argument. <laughs> but a metaphorical kind of indulgence, I would call it. And I think in the temper, it was another, I think the word's called conceit, you know, literary word, this long kind of almost exaggerated metaphor of, in that case, a speaker speaking to his temper as if it's a separate person. Mm -hmm. And the, what I find about cool about that poem is that it's just a sort of crazy speaker speaking to his temper and realizing the temper has a mind of its own that he can almost detach from. And the ending lines that you described were really also metaphorical about the fact that the temper has a life of its own. And if you're aware of that, you can more or less control it, which is what the speaker is doing. And the reference there to the knife turning and the, and the glare on the knife being kind of this like repressed anger, um, which is exemplified by this person's temper, own temper. No, I love that that idea and image of the temper being a separate thing that can get out of control that you then have the ability to control because it's a separate entity. Uh, that's that's uh, right. that's great. Yeah, exactly. So you also write beautifully about your mother in several of the poems, including the apron, which you'll read later. How do you yes. balance being true to the poetry? and true to the people you are close to when crafting a poem? Yeah, very good question. So in this, just just as of a preface statement, it was, um, I think, a risk to write something so personalized to sort of start my, let's call it, poetry career in writing. And I decided, in the case of my mother, uh, Margaret, it was her name, um, to kind of create these narratives around her. Of course, you know, the truth is much more boring than art. So nothing is actually perfectly true. And, and, and all poets, you know, create a mural, if you will, that's much more beautiful than probably the reality of what they have experienced or described. But that said, um, I think in the case of the third section of the book called Verdicts, which are whose theme, the common theme is around my mother. Um, you know, it was a very creative person, very mystical person. The person who introduced me to poetry, which by the way, was the genesis, genesis for this idea of, you know, dedicating the book to her and writing this section, third section, more or less around her. But um, it's always an imperfect art. But I, in those poems, I would say in that group of poems, I was capturing a lot of the pathos of my mother and things I experienced with her, um, always making it rooted in the visual, actually not in the emotional. And I was very conscious of not creating sentimental poems that were about you know self-pity or about heartbreak and so forth, but let the visual description carry the weight of any emotion that was occurring, which I think made the poems much more resonant and successful than, you know, a lot of poetry, which could be, you know, overly sentimental. And in the end, not really able to communicate to a large readership. So how do you approach form in your poetry? Do you start a poem having an idea of the form it will take, or does that emerge later? Oh, I love this question. Well, I, I would say that and, and Christina Marie Darling, the, the wonderful um, editor in chief of, of Tupelo Press and Tupelo Quarterly, she she described me as a neoclassic poet, which I suppose is an allusion to my sense of structure and form in a poem. But I am guilty of being, I think, a very aesthetic poet. So I not 
only approach my work in terms of the beauty of the music, I think, and my sense of the rhyme and meter in a poem. And, and I am experimental in that I certainly love free verse, but most of my poems are structured visually on the page in terms of the stanza blocks, the length of the line. I aim for a certain like aesthetic harmony and clustering um, stanzas in a certain way. And if you look through the book, I think most of them are calculated. They're not just sort of thrown on the page. Um, some are deliberately free form and some are clustered visually. And some even go so far as using rhyme and meter, um, which I've heard is like completely out of vogue these days. <laughs> Unless you, well, I interviewed A.E. Stallings <laughs> earlier this year and 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 she uh, talked about that actually. And I think it's, uh, I think there's a way to be modern and also incorporate received forms. And, uh, but yes, for some reason, the, these things come in cycles. It's, it's definitely going in cycles. Less, I, yeah, I, I read, by the way, just as an anecdote, you know, when I've submitted poems to literary reviews, you see sometimes do not submit rhyme poems. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Now I realize why a literary review may say that because they may receive some very bad rhyme poems that are just awful. I get that, but I do believe in, um, the beauty of form. And I think it can express itself in many different ways. So I do sometimes approach a poem and say, I'm going to write a sonnet or I'm going to write a villanelle or I'll write a version of a sonnet. Or, you know, in the case of Zeus, a poem I'll read later, it's actually a series of couplets and it's rhymed. And in that case, I was careful to balance the rhymes or nuance the rhymes so the rhyme didn't overpower the the content you were reading, but you use half rhyme and kind of alternating rhymes. So I do believe in my case, I find a lot of pleasure in constructing poetry around a certain amount of form. And very often the form is related to the content. And, and that's usually how I approach writing. Yeah, I think that there's a way to use form that you only see it on the third or fourth read. Carmen, Carmine DiBiase, who... I interviewed uh, early in the podcast. He has wrote a series of Shakespeare-inspired sestinas, and a sestina is an incredibly uh, uh, challenging form. But you wouldn't even yeah. know it was a sestina until you read it several times. It doesn't. It's not right in your face. So yeah, I agree. I think there's a way to do it that doesn't uh, scream out, "I'm a rhyming poem." Right. Um, you also incorporate place into your poetry. From Kaki Beach to Tourist Paris to Carita. Torita, by the way, is one of my favorite poems in the book, uh, with, again, oh, very good. rich imagery. One example from Carita. The pregnant Caesura arrives. The Toreador marches away from the crumpled bull. How do you, when you're traveling the world, are you always on the lookout? for poetic inspiration now that you've that that place plays a role in many of your poems and you're act or are you actually consciously traveling for inspiration or are you just looking for inspiration while you're traveling well it's it's a really interesting question so the uh, confession Corita was written probably in 1998 after i had visited spain and I wrote this poem, which is very, by the way, disjointed visually on the page and, you know, a description of this bullfight and was very visually intense. It was like beautiful and horrific at the same time. Um, but my life, I'll say this about myself, is that I'm probably very much a global citizen. As you know, I'm Greek parents, grew up in New York, lived in Paris I lived between Europe and the United States my whole life, and I've had the good fortune of living in different cultures, uh, um, whether it was Greece when I was a child with my grandmother or living in France where I went to business school and I worked in the beauty industry for L'Oréal. And then part of me is very American. You know, uh, a lot of people say, oh, you're so American, you know, which I find interesting because when I'm in France, people say you're so French, <laughs> although I don't look French at all. Um, I played rugby in France, ironically. Um, I don't know. I, I'm, I don't want to say I'm a chameleon, but I grew up with 
I'd say multiple cultures, which has made me more uh, open and curious. But I will say the record, a lot of the poems that I ended up refining for the Oculus, a lot of the older poems just happened to be poems about places where I were. And you're right, I did derive a lot of inspiration from the sense of place. Um, in the case of Tourist Paris, having lived in Paris and lived as a, a, let's call it an expatriate in Paris and seeing, you know, all the crazy tourists arrive in Paris in droves. This was a sonnet form that I wrote about that very cliched experience, actually, of what you witness in Paris when you live there as the Parisian. And then in the case of um, Kiki Beach, that's a very strange poem about a little island in Greece called Spetsas, which is a small island of like well-to-do Athenians. And there's a little beach called Kiki Beach. And I remember being there and I remember seeing a woman looking completely lost and upset on the beach. And I just came up with this story of this woman who was not able to have children, who like is on this beach trying to find herself and her meaning of life. And, and it really was rooted in place, in the place, the trees, the smells, the sounds, the light. Um, and Corrida is the same. I found a lot of inspiration in the context of the place where the place is you know as important as the person uh and i think i recall recently there was some artist who you know there was this interesting sort of dilemma the dialectic between place and person and i think a lot of those type of poems the place is as important as a person and that creates the whole narrative if you will but an interesting comment in your part but that is definitely part of my poetry well, I've asked multiple poets about their approach to ordering and organizing a collection. Many, including me, fill their family room floor with printed poems to manipulate them in space. The Oculus <laughs> is organized, and you've already kind of hinted at this, organized into three named sections. Uh, talk about the process you went through to select and organize the poems into a, a book, into a collection that worked together. Well, okay. So this was the... Let's call it, there's the lyrical, emotional, intimate, isolated part of writing poetry and the poem and refining it and making it perfect. Then I am, uh, I meet Jeffrey Levine, the publisher of Tupelo Press, Christina Marie Darling, and they were incredible. And they challenged me to create a book. And here I was with a heap of work. And it was very daunting to me. It's like, okay, so how do I do this? And I don't think there was any logic, but then I started, you know, maybe the logical process, well, this is not a great poem and this one is a good poem and this one's less good. And, and then you're left with a subset of your work. And then I asked myself, how do I create a book? And then Christina and other people mentioned this to me, um, even my professor at Princeton, Maxine Cuman, very famous poet, um, talked about this narrative arc and I was asking myself, how do I organize the poems in an order and cluster in a way where I'm creating an arc that brings you from the beginning of the book to the end of the book. And I started climbing up with sections. The first section is called sentries, um, which are kind of poems alerting you to danger or things that can go wrong in life or things that can go right smaller poems and then the middle section Orioles is about light and it related to the theme of the Oculus. And those poems are mostly about places I've been to the world, more the poems we were just talking about tourist Paris and Corrida and so forth. And then the last section is verdicts, which converges on the theme of memory and my mother and the way memory shifts. And I see the past through the eyes of the present. So uh, it, there was a lot of thought that went into that and there was a lot of editing and, uh, fortunately I had people to speak to who were kind of brutal saying, don't do this, do this. And, you know, there was always these kind of intellectual debates. What do I keep? What don't I keep? But, um, it was one of the hardest things I've ever done. Cool. Well, a couple more questions before I hand the mic over to you to read from the Oculus. As a first time author of a poetry collection, when did you know, and it sounds like you got some feedback that nudged you in this direction, but when did you know you had a collection that was ready to be a published book? 
I didn't know until I spoke to um, outside voices like Christina Marie Darling helped me, uh, one of my first professors uh, in New York, Nancy Schoenberger, a terrific poet, great biographer, actually uh, encouraged me and clearly said, I have the makings of a book. And then a few poet friends and even readers, non, you know, non-poetic of poetry aficionados um, showed me that I have a volume of work. And I was at a point in my life, so I'm not the typical poet per se in that, you know, I went to an MFA program and spent my whole life writing. I mean, I literally is someone who started writing when I was a teenager, when I was in college, was in creative writing programs in New York in the 80s. I was doing some writing, but throughout my life, I wrote in my own corner and I was submitting work to literary reviews, getting acceptances, but I had another life as a businessman, CEO of a company, you know, athlete, doing many different things outside of the world of writing. And I just didn't focus on it. And it was actually during COVID that everything stopped. And I was at my home in Martha's Vineyard with like, I don't know, the wind blowing and the leaves blowing and alone and there's no food. And I was focused on writing and creating a book. And I think it was at that point, I just had the urge to express myself with a complete body of work and I made it happen. I, I can completely relate to that because I first started writing poetry when I was in 10th grade, wrote sporadically, kind of published to the web a little bit. And it was really just something I did for myself, shared with family. And then the pandemic kicked me into creative high gear, the, particularly the stress of the pandemic. And yeah, that's when a friend of mine said, hey, you should write a lot more poetry. And I just felt that I now had critical mass to create a book. So yes, I, I think there's a number of books that were triggered by the pandemic disruption. Right. right. Yeah, you did the right thing. I mean, better to write poetry than, I don't know, smoke cigarettes or God knows what, gain 40 pounds. Absolutely. When I couldn't <laughs> sleep in the middle of the night during the peak pandemic stress, I would just write until I got sleepy. And I, uh, I now the problem is I'm sleeping a lot better. So my folly, I have to really carve time out of the day. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> So before I pass the bike, the bike to you, what advice do you have for poets dreaming of having a poem selected for publication? My advice would be write a poem that comes from a place of truth um, as to what you're writing about, who you are. It doesn't have to be about you. It doesn't have to be autobiographical, by the way. But when I mean a place of truth, that the poem really has things to say and it's extremely authentic. And I do believe in craft and it's crafted well and it is economical and it's powerful and you know, uses active verbs and I don't know, is not overly complicated. I, I do also believe really good poetry communicates. And on some level it is very clear, even if it's clear after 10 readings. Um, and I think that's hard to do. The, part of me thinks that really good poetry is not selfish. It's very generous to the reader. And it's more about communicating what's in the, in the great depths of the imagination to someone with such clarity that they're moved by what you're thinking and writing. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, and of course I support any poet of any kind, you know, who is actually writing because it's such a beautiful art form and, um, I just think it elevates humanity that poetry exists at all. Beautiful. A beautiful way to transition. And I'm now going to hand the mic over to you to read selections from the Oculus. So I'm going to read a poem um, called Zeus. Uh, and this is a poem that is um, a series of rhyme couplets, which I mentioned for those who can't see the poem. And um, it's a poem about, uh, you'll discover, a dog. And um, it's a poem actually about companionship. Zeus, you master the trick of loving obliquely, my nimble, thick, sable-coated buddy, and present the ball with a shrill Sheba cry, then repel my call to drop. Still we comply with our rules in tandem, how I follow the wagging of your coiled tail 
whose tune metronome to sense of bones decaying quickens without fail. How helplessly your fan, I take in the long spans of your run stitching time, which becomes serpentine hunts and tangles of vine, their own realm of pantomime. You in turn curl at my feet when I read or shave or eat neatly in a ball. Reeking pond, you sidle beside me to be pet. Such games of coy beget games of coy. Do I respond and curb you with a shout or descend and bestow kisses on your human snout? We both grow old together, however, you whiten too. Like sun rays in winter, I'm afraid to admit the ardor of your dash grows weaker. Yet you still patrol the fences and chase at tails through the salty fog with tireless affection. Dog of my heart, you live like run on cursive, always in the present tense. And while your mother and I prattle over cocktails, our sonorous common sense, you fall asleep by the fire, feel the blanket of parents. So the next poem I'll read is titled The Apron, uh, which is somewhat an autobiographical poem, I'd say somewhat prose-like, um, about the simple incident where uh, my mother has died and I go to her home and find her apron and it inspired the writing of this poem. I'm wearing my mother's apron I found on the inside of the cupboard door, aged to a peppery beige. The shock of it hanging on a nail, slump shouldered as if she had just slipped out in a rush to die as she was making stewed lamb and greasy potatoes and crispy filo rudders through me. She likely left the candles burning on the perfectly set table, tines of forks glinting like the tiny knots of silver crosses sewn into the bishop's robe that would one day cordon her rose-sprinkled grave. Now at her seat at the head of the table preside shakers of rice coupled like dolls and bowls of rubber grapes. I tie the belt loop around my broadening waist, filling out her form to prepare the meal she never finished. I pat down the crumpled lap of shorn linen, marked by raised red embroidery of the word mom and script. Cheap sentiment, yes, but I ride a passing longing, feeling the soft edge of the page she thumbed as I decipher a recipe for lemon soup she wrote in pencil smudged to a sheen, marred by a few dry stains. Ironic how this apron covers as it cloaked me once before, the summer of 1957, over the flow of steaming casseroles and sisters' muted screams to cheers of ball games and activists for civil rights in the blistering TV set. As she carried me inside her through the battered rooms whose wounds I grew to love as I set this plate of hot rice to swinging bells of incense, Kyrie eleison three times to the timer clicking shut. And the third poem I will read is titled The Leaf. And this is a, a poem that is a long conceit or I would call it an exaggerated metaphor about a meditation on um, a couple that's having difficulty being together and the struggle to be connected. I decided to leave you while idled watching a leaf burnished and crisp flaunt its weightlessness rise in a spiral before the wind stole it like a kite, then left it to cantilever, find its child's stride and glide flat through the shaft 
of seaward air the gulls pursued where I craved sharp horizons. The leaf came back in a spin. Who knew? Our dog Zoe craned her neck to follow its descent like the swirls on the cornet of a seashell or nosedive of a plane. She also spun a circle. I could not share her euphoria, mind you, eyeing the leaf like an ember resigned before its spark extinguished sink. It turned out the leaf was ordinary, serrated symmetrically on each side, cradling me back to boredom. On drafts of heat toward the bee-clotted field, its lowering stalled, scrolling longer and looser garlands as if signing a letter goodbye. I could hear the lyric of oceans receding, rising, tides washing away the prints of my walks on shelves of cold, shiny sand. Zoe perked her winsome eyes as the leaf peeked between arcs, our tracking blunted by the shift of sun through the brittle of leaves triggering a brocade of shadows. I heard the twist of faucet chirp in a wave of rustling, water tumble in the metal sink, your footsteps silent in the lawn coming toward me in wet concave depressions, at which point she relinquished Sphinx's pose, slipping her head in the soft crevice between paws as if breaking prayer the leaf trembling as it landed on strong tips of grass. Oh, so wonderful to hear those poems shared uh, with your voice. Just a couple of questions about two of them. Sure. So Zeus reminds me of a series of poems I wrote about my younger daughter's Devon Rex cat and uh, just uh, animals in general are just wonderful sources of inspiration and images muses almost unintentionally. And they, they have no, it's interesting. They would have no idea that they're muses. Uh, and un un amused that's not aware that they're amused there could be an idea there anyways um, I'm particularly interested in the form of this poem which you've touched on short lines couplets you've talked a little bit about how you approach form the use of rhyming but in a way that's not Dr. Zeusian uh, so how did this poem evolve from its first edit uh, when did the form become apparent or is the form something in this particular case that you had going into the poem interesting in this case the poem started with a type of what I would call sonic tension, where I came upon these lines that were actually highly rhyming. Um, you master the trick of loving obliquely, my nimble, thick, sable-coated buddy, and present the ball with a shrill sheep a cry, then repel my call to drop. So the poem started very sing-songy. Um, and actually, it's strong sonic tension, not too corny, you know, kind of musical. But then I realized I can make a longer poem that still rhymed and start slanting the rhymes and um, creating more complicated rhyme schemes and creating almost a kind of complicated version where a line that rhymed the rhyming line was much later. It wasn't necessarily juxtaposed to the line it rhymed to. And as the poem goes on, it uses half rhyme. And in the end, it was almost a game, literally, where I created this, you know, 30 couplet poem, 30 couplets, and made sure that every line rhymed somewhere with another line. So it had this type of um, auditory uh, structure. Um, but I like the idea, to be honest, that the dog, you know, I do did have a dog, Zeus, who actually deceased after I wrote the poem. My friends were like, oh, you wrote a poem about your dog who died. I was like, actually, no, I wrote a poem about the dog <laughs> and he was with us. But um, what I like about that poem is that I think the subject of a dog that someone's close to merits a type of familiar poetic form, not a complicated one, one that is somewhat accessible and mm -hmm. sort of fun to read to an audience. So that's how that poem structure came about. Cool. Well, The Apron is such a beautiful poem. I'm really glad you chose to read it. 
how did writing this poem and capturing the memories and images that you describe so effectively change your understanding and appreciation of your mother? Interesting. Um, so I realized that in writing the poem, I realized, I suppose, the depth of loss of losing one's mother. And, you know, that occurs to so many different people. What I realized was, I think in life, when there's a weight of some emotion, let's say the loss of one's mother or the loss of anything dear to someone or whatever it may be, that talking about it, writing about it, you know, they call it therapy. Um, it somehow gives you control over the emotion. I think in this case with the apron, I was first focused on the memories, you know, of the loss of my mother at the time. I mean, not a tragedy, certainly. She had a great life and just part of my life. But what was interesting was, I think as a poet, I wanted to concentrate the description of the apron so intensely that it almost became non-sentimental and it was almost detach myself from probably very emotional sentimental words and the poem i think is highly disciplined because it basically talks about an apron and nothing more in a way and the description of the apron and everything that means and i think this sort of um clever idea i would say where i find an apron it's hers then I wear the apron and I finish the meal. She's not finished. She didn't finish before she died. And then I realize the apron I'm wearing covered me as an adult, the same way it covered me when she was pregnant with me 50 years ago. And I came upon that sort of poetic device of repetition, um, things coming full circle. And um, I think what, to answer your question more specifically, I think what I learned from this is, um, of course, you know, my mother was dear to me, um, but that the poem can transcend actually just the pure emotion of my mother and in and of itself work as an object. And in the end, the poem is really about what an apron means and what it can mean more than about my actual mother. And that's where I think good poetry transcends emotion and can work as an object in and of itself that is inspiring. Yeah, it leaves itself open also to people interpreting it in different ways that they relate to. And it's not so constrained to your specific emotion or ideas that it it, it loses that ability to be expansive. So I, I think that's a wonderful example. Yeah. And James, that that's a good point. And what I alludes to this thinking I always had about generosity, I think a generous poet will not write necessarily about themselves and how they feel and then because all that is is a form of diary or a form of cell therapy or a form of you know evacuating some stress or some euphoria whatever it may be i think a poem you're right in the end uh can reach out and work as a body of language that someone can project into what they need and i think that's the most generous type of poem wonderful well finally what are you working on now well, I'm pleased to announce that uh, Tupelo Press will publish my second book called Perishable, which is written. Um, that was having another child, like like within the nine month gestation period. I had two, <laughs> two children. The Oculus, which is actually launching on October 20th on Amazon and the independent bookstores, and Perishable is another different type of book that will come out next year in 23, which I'm excited about. So I'm now at a point, James, where I don't want to write because I fear uh, it's, uh, I feel like if I start writing, I'll go down the vortex of writing. And I think I need a little break. And I'm honestly, I'm working on just getting out there uh, doing this podcast is terrific because I'm able to reach out to the community and uh, just share with readers and 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 writers uh, what I've written and and that's really what I want to focus on now makes sense yeah I think that that's something I'm trying to remember which one of the interviews I did there's there's writing poetry and then there's the po business or po poetry business that's uh, the all the things you need to do to help connect people with what you've written and it it, it is except for lightning in a bottle which is extremely rare 
whether it's a business or a product or a, po a poetry collection, you have to help connect the audience to it. And that's a super important thing that poets I th who want, who, who, for whom that getting their poems in front of as many people as possible is an important element of it. You have to make it happen. So I, 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 I totally agree. Yeah, you're right. So, yeah. So it's, uh, so I'm very excited. You know, I want to thank you for, uh, inviting me to your podcast and loved your insights and questions and it's been fun meeting you and um amazing the time zone difference right you're in los angeles i think i'm in the san francisco bay area actually <laughs> yeah. Bay area. yeah san francisco i'm in london so amazing the technology has connected us this way amazing yes yeah. so i want to thank you so much to others for sharing your poetry the oculus and your voice on the viewless wings poetry podcast today Viewless Wings Poetry Podcast is written and produced by James Moorhead. You can follow me on Twitter at Dublin Ranch, subscribe to the Viewless Wings Poetry Podcast, and follow us on viewlesswings.com or on Instagram at viewlesswings.com.